So 50 years ago, traveling looked like this. Yeah, you had these great looking seats. Look at the food. The service, top notch. And look at the way everybody is dressed. I mean, seriously, this looks like a great time. And when you talk to former airline executives, they confirm it really was as glamorous as it looks. We served those beautiful meals and people dressed up when they got on the plane. And yes, there were dress codes, but people would have dressed well even without the rules. Compare that to today. Yeah, people showing up in their pajamas, walking around in flip-flops. Yeah, just look at the outfits. I don't know what this guy was thinking when he put this one together. And nothing wrong with showing a little bit of skin, but yeah, this may be a little bit too much. So what happened? Why did people stop wearing nice clothing? Why did they stop dressing sharp when traveling? Now, before I get into the reasons of why we stopped dressing sharp when we're traveling, I wanted to introduce you to a luggage company that still maintains the classic style of old school cool. Guys, I'm talking about Carl Friedrich. If you haven't been over, guys, check out their luggage. I have to say it is absolutely beautiful. I own and I use this luggage. They've got a variety of bags. They got weekenders. They have briefcases. Heck, if you're looking for a wallet, they've got a wide variety of great options over there. But let's talk specifically about their carry-on and their check-in luggage. Now, first up, I want to introduce you to the Carry-On Pro. This is my preferred piece of luggage whenever I'm traveling. Not only are you going to be able to have quick access to your laptop or anything that you want to have right there on the side outside package. And if you don't need that extra pouch, then just grab their classic carry-on. I have this bag as well. This one I used for the longest time and I have to say, guys, I can't see enough great things about it. And for any of you experienced travelers out there, you know the importance of good spinner wheels. These wheels right here, made by Hinamoto, it's the gold standard brand for wheel manufacturing on luggage. And if you're looking for something larger, something you can check in, well, guess what? They've got their classic check-in. Again, it's going to have the same great looks as the carry-on, but in a little bit larger size. Everything over at Carl Friedrich has a 100-day trial. I absolutely love the fact that you can actually try out this luggage. You can try out their bags. You can try out their wallets. And if you are not satisfied after 100 days, guess what? Return it. But here's the deal. Nobody does that because their stuff is friggin' amazing. In addition, everything comes with a lifetime warranty. Now, gents, Carl Friedrich isn't cheap, but I've seen designer brands that charge three to four to five times as much as these guys do, and they do not provide any better quality or even design. And that's what I love about Carl Friedrich. I've been promoting this company since they first started, and I've always loved the fact that you actually, for what you pay, you get an amazing deal. So, gents, to get the best deal on the web, use that link in the description of today's video go over to Carl Friedrich. Highly recommended. Awesome company. Proud to support them. Now, to start things off, gents, I want to give you a little bit of history. So, commercial airline travel has actually been around for well over 100 years. Let's go back to 1914. We've got the first commercial flight between Tampa and St. Petersburg, Florida. Now, the reality is air travel did not take off very quickly. There were a number of limitations, but a big one is just simply there wasn't much demand for it because it was incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah, through the 1920s, you had unpressurized cockpits. So, you had people flying from point A to point B and they had to actually wear really warm clothing. It was bumpy. It was cold. You had to deal with pressure going up and down. It could be downright uncomfortable. So, really, it was the mail that was taking advantage of this. Yes, actually to be able to transport important items quickly, that's really where air travel was being utilized. Despite this, in the 1930s, we saw air travel really start to pick up. In 1930, they estimate about 6,000 people traveled by air. By 1934, that number had ballooned up to over 400,000. And as you can tell by those last numbers, it was the 1930s that really transformed air travel. All of a sudden, it was something that people aspired to do. The airlines took note of this, the early ones did, and they started making it a lot more comfortable for the people that were traveling. So, all of a sudden, the seats became more luxurious and it was the emergence of a particular aircraft, the Douglas DC-3 that changed everything. The DC-3 was safe, it was reliable, and it could fly higher, it could fly faster, and therefore, it was more comfortable because it wasn't dealing with a lot of the turbulence that you deal with at lower altitudes. This aircraft all of a sudden made it so that airfare travel all of a sudden became something that was luxurious, something that was sought after. Now, World War II obviously changed things up. Resources were dedicated to military aircraft, but guess what? You got tons of people getting 
used to flying, tons of pilots being trained up, airfields being built around the world. And all of a sudden, Boeing, the 307, jumped into things in the late 1940s after the war. Now, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but the pressurization of the cabin, this was a big thing the Boeing 307 brought to the table. All of a sudden, you were able to fly at 20,000 feet and it wasn't a big issue. You're able to maintain temperature, but more importantly, you're able to maintain pressure. It wasn't uncomfortable. Anyone that's ever flown in an unpressurized aircraft, I know when I was in the Marine Corps, I blew out my sinuses doing a penetration dive. So, it is something that it can be incredibly painful in an unpressurized cockpit or, you know, aircraft. And all of a sudden, this made it much more appealing and comfortable to the masses. In the 1950s, we saw two big things. First up, the introduction of the jet engine. Again, they were able to fly higher, faster, and more reliable and safer. Next up, let's talk about statistics. All of a sudden, you had the numbers. More people were flying by air than by train. Boeing now introduced the 707 and the time of the jetliner was upon us. And by the time we hit the 1960s, the party had started. So, all of a sudden, airlines are taking it to the next level. You look at all the food being served and this stuff is popping up in the movies. Even though the majority of Americans have not yet traveled on an airplane, many people are looking at this as aspirational. And going into the 1970s, things just keep getting better. I mean, faster. So, all of a sudden, we got the introduction of the Concorde. We are able to cross the Atlantic Ocean from London to New York in about three and a half hours. So, what happened? How did we go from traveling across the Atlantic in style, faster than the speed of sound, eating great food to this? Yes, another picture to remind you of what you have to look forward to at most airports. So, reason number one that most people today do not dress sharp for air travel is it's one of the unintended consequences of the Deregulation Act of 1978. I'm talking about the Airline Regulation Act. In case you didn't know, before 1978, the airlines were regulated by the US government. The price was set as to how much you would have to pay to fly. Well, after 1978, the price was no longer fixed. All of a sudden, new airlines could be formed more easily, competition was allowed. Basically, we saw air travel move from being a privilege of the few to a service for the multitudes. Now, first up, I want to be clear. This, in my opinion, is a great thing that more people are able to fly because the prices are no longer regulated. In fact, if you look at the cost in like 1941 to be able to fly across the country, it was like well over $4,000 on average for a ticket in today's dollars. Nowadays, that same ticket is going to cost you what? Five to six hundred bucks. In fact, if you look at 1978 and the average cost of pretty much any domestic ticket in the United States, it has fallen by over 50 percent. And that counts all these additional fees that the airlines today are throwing in. So, basically, what I'm saying is after 1978, all of a sudden, you saw prices continuously fall. So, throughout the 1980s, throughout the 1990s, it became much more accessible for the average person to be able to fly. Think about it this way. In 1975, if you were flying on an airplane, pretty much all the seats were equivalent to what is today first class. You were paying a lot more for those seats and therefore, you were getting a lot more. Because the prices were regulated, the airlines, you know, it was pretty stable, they were making good profits and they were able to give more because of that. Compare that to flying on an airplane today when you've got a wide range of different options on the same aircraft. From first class to business class to, you know, just an economy to all the different types of economy to, you know, where they're crushing you up in the back and you almost have no leg room. But the thing is, is you can pay for those additional things. Most most of us don't want to and we don't like the idea, but we sometimes have to splurge because, yes, I want to sit with my family, which who would have thought you could have to pay for that? But even including all of these fees, you're still actually saving money compared to what you were paying back, you know, before deregulation. Now, I understand I'm not going to get into dynamic pricing and how that works and why the airlines are putting more people in more seats and all this other stuff. That could be reserved for a whole other video. But what did this do? All of a sudden, the floodgates were opened and you had a wider variety. Basically, you had people that previously could not afford to fly that all of a sudden are getting on airlines. Now, gents, don't read into this and think that I'm saying that people with less monetary means 
dress poorly while those with money are going to dress nicer though. What happened to the airlines in general is it went from being an exclusive service that people, you know, were spending a lot of money on and therefore would dress for the occasion. All of a sudden it became a, just a means of transportation. It was no longer an event. So as this happened over a period of a couple decades, people just stopped dressing up for it. All of a sudden they realized, Hey, I'm just simply going from point A to point B. It is no longer the party. It is no longer, you know, the event that it used to be. On top of that, we've got the next reason. And this one I think for a lot of you guys is the obvious one and that is as a society, our dress codes have become a lot more lax. We are very relaxed. It seems like, yeah, we go to the mall, you go anywhere and people are wearing pajamas out in public. So it just makes sense. If they're wearing pajamas out in public, they're going to wear them just simply to go from point A to point B when they're traveling through the airport. I mean, some people, a lot of people say, oh, it's incredibly comfortable, but I know a lot of people it's simply, that's how they dress all the time. They don't own any nice clothing because as a society, we've moved towards this leisure wear. We've moved towards sweat sweats, hoodies, you know, just torn up jeans. This is what people wear on a daily basis. They don't even own clothing that, yeah, you look back in the 1950s and 60s that people were wearing. Most people don't even have that stuff readily available in their wardrobe. Now, gents, really quick, I want to hear from you down in the comments below. What are your thoughts? Do you think that people should start dressing better when they're traveling or do you think it's perfectly fine? What do you wear? Guys, I want to hear from you in the comments down below. Next up, let's talk about what the airlines are doing. They are, and I talked a little bit about dynamic pricing. They're getting more more and more people on these airlines. And that's great. We're spending less money, but it's not great if you are a big guy, if you are stuck in this small seat, if you notice that, hey, there are all these great nonstop, you know, flights. I love them. But when they go for eight to 10 to 12 hours, all of a sudden, and this is the next reason that dress codes are going down, is that people are just putting a higher priority on comfort. And I truly believe that great looking clothing, if it fits you well, is comfortable, but I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say that this right here is more comfortable than a hoodie. No, you know, again, I would maybe, I would feel inappropriate wearing pajamas on an airplane, but if you're used to wearing that clothing, it is. I mean, when I'm at home relaxing, I'm wearing pajamas. I am wearing athletic gear because it's just comfortable to lounge around and move around it. So if I'm going to be on a nonstop flight from maybe Chicago to Mumbai, you better believe that uh, I'm going to wear comfortable clothing. Am I going to wear sweatpants? Probably not, but I can see that people are putting a high priority because of the situation the airlines are putting a lot of people into that, uh, yeah, they want to make sure they are comfortable. Next up, let's talk about social interaction. When people are on airplanes nowadays, you notice people don't want to talk. It used to be, I don't know, I remember a time when you would get on and you looked forward to talking to the person on your left talking on your right. Usually they had great conversation skills. You would meet somebody new. I've heard of people like finding jobs this way. Nowadays, people don't even want to talk. They don't want to interact. You can tell because they're throwing in their earbuds. They're putting on those huge oversized headphones. They have noise cancellation. And I mean, nothing wrong with that. I enjoy some great music, but uh, good luck. You know, I was on an airplane the other day, looking to my left, looking to my right. And everybody is in their own world. A big part of this is a reflection as a society where we've gone. We're not really looking to make random encounters or engage with people. We're looking just to simply stay focused on our own concerns, what we have going on, just simply to draw, to hide out the world. In fact, you know, people are wearing those hoodies. They're wearing the, you know, that clothing so that they can bring the hood over their head and they can purposely shut off everything around them. And let me be clear. I'm not demonizing these people. In fact, I have sat next to people who I would rather not, not be talking to. So I see the point and I see the, you know, why people want to do this, especially again, in a time of COVID when, yeah, they don't want anyone breathing or coughing on them and like talking, spitting on them. But yeah, I do feel like something has been lost. The random interaction with strangers and people, especially when you're heading to a destination, maybe the only place is different when you're flying into Vegas. People that are going to Vegas, always there's like this party type of feel and you're always looking for someone to party with, especially if you got someone that's young and attractive next to you, right? Now, if you've watched the video this far, you may be thinking, well, Antonio, what do you want them to re-regulate the airlines, have dress codes? You want them to knock the prices up to be able to keep people out? No, I think the way we've got it set up now is actually a great thing. It could be better, but uh, you know, the prices, wow, almost anybody can travel anywhere in the world. This is a great thing for people to be able to spend less of their income on average and be able to see the world. 
That being said, I really do see a lot of the points of people that are saying, hey, I've got a tiny seat. I'm spending a lot of time in the airplane. I want to dress for comfort. I understand that people also have really high stress levels. They want to wear clothing that's incredibly comfortable because they've already gone through an hour of security. They were waiting in line for an hour. They had to travel an hour to get to the airport. They've been up since three o'clock in the morning. This person just wants to be able to go to sleep. They're on a 10 hour flight. Yeah, I can see wearing comfortable clothing, taking your pillow and you know, the whole, you know, pillow arm, you know, head things. I understand, you know, that there's a time and a place for that stuff. That being said, if you forced me to actually lay out a couple rules I wish everybody would follow when we're traveling. And I think everyone will agree on these. It's simply be clean and be courteous, right? Don't be smelling up the place. Don't be wearing dirty, nasty clothing that, yeah, I don't even want to sit next to you and be courteous. Be, have good manners. I understand we're having to sit right next to each other, but let's just talk about, yeah, you can have the armrest. You are in the center aisle. That's just common courtesy. Guys, if we can agree, clean and courteous, smash that like button. Wouldn't it just be nice if people followed those two rules when they're traveling? Yeah, I'd like to see the suit make a comeback, but just being clean and courteous would go a long way. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering, Antonio, what's your opinion? Well, no surprises. I am a style guy, so I know the power of style, dressing well, and how it can affect you and those around you. So, I'm not saying you need to wear a suit when you fly. I'm not even saying you need to wear a sports jacket. I am saying, though, you should dress well. And to me, first up, this shows respect to yourself. I know whenever I wear nice clothing, I stand up a little bit straighter. I feel better. I feel more awake. I feel more alert. The study of, you know, I've talked about the science of enclosed cognition shows that actually you can perform at a higher level. And then, of course, it's how other people perceive you. My friend Pat Flynn, I was just speaking with him the other day, and he had really upped his style. And Pat travels around, speaks. He was late running to the San Diego airport and he really needed help from the people working the front desk. And he doesn't normally dress well, you know, dress this well. He's wearing a sports jacket. He felt people treated him differently. They actually helped get him on that flight, which he thought he was going to miss. And he felt part of that was because he looked important. And I'm not saying that the world is always going to treat you better when you dress well, but I will say that in general, people are going to make an assumption that if you look successful, they're going to treat you like success. So why start, you know, off, you know, why shoot yourself in the foot? Why not dress in a manner that you look like you belong with the successful people? Next up, let's talk about comfort. So, I'm not going to, again, say that this is as comfortable as a hoodie, but I know for me when I'm traveling, I'm around people, I want to dress well because it's always about opportunity that could possibly come my way. When I'm talking with random people, when, you know, sometimes people recognize me from the channel here, I want to make sure that I meet expectations. I want to make sure that if opportunity comes my way, if I happen to, I get off the airport, next thing I know, I'm running into somebody. I know somebody that I may be recognized. I want to make a great first impression. If somebody, you know, it's like, again, I may go right to a business meeting. I want to make sure that I've got the versatility that comes with looking the part of who I am. Again, if you work in the construction industry, it may be different. If you are a lawyer though, and you're traveling, if you are a consultant, it may be something that you want to dress in a manner. So, if the plane was delayed, you could immediately get off that plane, go right to the client's office and be able to go right into a meeting dressed as you are, even if they lost your luggage. Now, this next one is more of just like me being a prepper and thinking about these things. But if you had to get off that airplane quickly, if there was a fire, are you dressed in a manner that you're going to be able to actually be able to kind of protect yourself. I think so many people, yeah, you're wearing flip flops and there's an emergency evacuation. You're going to be barefoot. Those things are going to fly off. You're going to lose them. And uh, yeah, things like shorts. And I always try to dress in a manner. I, always, I like to wear cotton as well, because if you know anything about heat with synth, a lot of that synthetic cheap clothing, it's actually going to melt right onto your skin. Yeah, I know it sounds gross, but uh, yeah, cotton at least can be pulled or removed off the skin pretty easily. Again, these things happen on airplanes, it's pretty rare, but I always like to, I also like options as well. I, I layer because I can take things off. I can put them on depending on the temperature and how it is in the aircraft. Getting back to those first things, I like to dress in a manner that I'm showing respect to my fellow passengers and myself. I like to dress for opportunity and yeah, I dress for protection, whether it's the elements or if something else could happen on the aircraft. All right, Jen, so what video to watch next? How about why did men stop being gentlemen? What happened? When did we stop honestly just caring? Guys, check out the video here. I think you're going to enjoy it. It's a good one. Boom, right there. Oh, yeah.